This is Distant Replay, the podcast that goes back in time to relive all the greatest events that we witnessed in sports. From upsets, to championships, to cultural moments, we discuss it all. Coming up on today's episode. Fourth and five, the national championship on the line right here. He's going for the Welcome in to the first ever episode of the Distant Replay podcast, where you heard it in the intro. We talk about old games. We go back and relive old games, the best games, right, of our generation, previous generations, the games that we still talk about today that have lived on through the through throughout time and games we reference back to when we're comparing players, comparing teams, comparing coaches, all that. It's all right here on Distant Replay, and we got to have a fun show tonight. A great game to kick things off, but before we do that, let me introduce myself. You probably heard the trailer. Hopefully you did before picking up this podcast, but I'm Ben George. My buddy Mike Noto. Mike, what's going on, bud? Hey, Benny. How you doing, man? I'm good, man. How fired up are you to start a podcast? I'm excited, man. You know, we, 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 met, we met a while ago. The one thing among one thing among a lot of things that bond us together is our love of a love of sports and uh i'm excited to take some of the conversations that we've had about sports you know behind the scenes and get them on a podcast and uh you know hopefully use this as a platform to you know unite with other sports fans and uh, relive some of the moments that uh that really you know sort of mark times in our lives you know you know i, I mean i remember you know this game in particular where I was when it happened and, and how awesome it was. Yeah, and I think what's going to be fun is a couple of things. We have different perspectives, right? So you are pro sports, Northeast. You know, you, you, have a, you have a different upbringing than me, who was in the South, Alabama, college sports primarily. But only that, like we, we were also worked in TV for a while. I still do some stuff in TV. But we have that kind of background and kind of know what goes into TV. And we're around these games that we're going to be covering and kind of saw them from a different angle. So I think all that will play into the podcast as we go along. And I think that's what's going to make it fun. But as you mentioned, we want everybody else to be a part of the conversation too. That's a part of us going back and watching this is like reliving what we saw and, and what we thought was really cool. And everybody's got a different take on it. So a couple of ways you can get in touch with us. It's through email, right? Distantpodcast at gmail.com. We're going to be on Twitter, Distant Podcast on Twitter. And then also our website, distantreplaypodcast.com, where we're going to have show notes for all these shows, right? And I think the fun thing about the show notes, and I think they'll evolve as we go, and I was thinking about some of this as I was listening or, or watching this first game, was I want to put in screenshots from some of these games. Like, I got a picture of Lane Kiffin on my phone right now from this game that we're going to talk about in this show, but like put that in there. We're going to put the, the, the YouTube links where we watch the game completely. Uh, and a lot of other stuff still to come in that too. So make sure you, you join that conversation and let's have some fun with it because you know, that's the whole idea. We're not, we're not going back here and watching four hours worth of uh, tape just to talk between the two of us. Right. Absolutely. And uh, you, you're, you're funny to bring up Lane Kiffin. Cause I also made some notes about uh Sarkeesian. <laughs> as well yes and how and how, how, how you know how how different he looked during this game as well yeah let's so so set up today's episode every every show we'll do we'll pick out one game we'll go back we'll watch that game completely we both take notes during the game we watch it on our own we both take our own notes we don't really discuss what we watched and what we witnessed and what we thought about the game until we get on this show so everything's kind of fresh with us and we'll kind of take this conversation wherever it takes us. So we'll we'll start off, we'll talk pregame. We're going to set up the game. Today's game is a 2006 BCS National Championship game. Texas, USC, some call it the greatest college football game of all time. I'm not going to be one that necessarily argues with that. But, you know, maybe it's a little dip, bit of a different take after we watched it than when we lived it 13 years ago. Uh, now, and so we're going to set the stage with kind of why we picked this game, everything leading up to what this game was about. Then we'll get into the game discussion. We'll, t we'll actually run through some plays, coaches, actual in-game stuff as we went back and watched it a second time, which is where Lane Kiffin and Steve Sarkeesian will fit in. And then we'll wrap it up with like some aftermath post-game thoughts on, 
you know, where these players win, what happened to the, the programs, the teams, the coaches, a lot of different fallout. So a lot of fun conversations. And this, I imagine this, this podcast will evolve quite a bit as we, we watch these games differently and figure out stuff that we really want to focus on. But that's going to be our game plan right out of the gate. So let's begin this, Mike, and I'm going to let's just set it up. So first game, this game took place January 4th, 2006, the Rose Bowl, easily the best venue in college football, maybe even all of football. Uh, this was a 2006 BCS National Championship game, number one, number two, the old BCS system. So I'll give you my thoughts on why we picked this. One, because it's arguably the greatest college football game of all time. And this is the one game I think I remember out of all college football games. If you say, what's the what was the greatest game you ever watched? This is probably it. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the thing that comes to mind for me for this game is what makes these college football games exciting is – Number one, star power. This game had about as much of it as I can remember for any college football game I've ever watched. And number two, build up. College football is all about the build up. I mean, we have yep. six, you know six weeks in between the the conference championship games and the you know BCS national championship game in this case. And just the build up to this game was even prior to that. These teams, number one and number two, the entire season. USC number one the whole year. Texas number two the whole year. It was all building to this night. And, you know, when you watch this game originally, you're just hoping it lives up to the billing. Yeah, and, and some other background on this game. USC entered on a 34-game winning streak, which, I mean, now you think about it, that's pretty pretty incredible. I mean, we've seen Alabama go on quite a run. Uh, and we saw, we've saw seen Florida go on a run since that time. We've seen a lot of good teams. But 34 games just doesn't happen at all anymore. And it's really impossible with this playoff system where you got to play – two top four teams potentially in order to stay undefeated. So that was a big thing. And the other big part of this, you mentioned star power. You had Matt Leinart and Reggie Bush in the same backfield. Bush was just off his Heisman Trophy win a couple weeks prior. This is the first time ever two Heisman Trophy winners played in the same backfield. And you'd probably even argue that Vince Young should have been the Heisman winner that year. And, and you know, the thing about USC, though, that I tried to remember was – just how big of a deal that team was. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had you had whole shows on ESPN leading up to this game where they would compare USC's team of 2005, 2006 to other legendary teams and literally have the conversation who would win. I mean, it was to that level with these guys. Um, they were like rock stars. You know, they, they there was this was a time in LA sports where the Lakers were in between the Shaq Kobe and the Gasol Kobe Laker teams and they hit it at the perfect time. They were the thing in LA and you know that's one thing that that really made this game special in my eyes was you know the Vince Young coming off his performance the year before in the Rose Bowl which I think to this point is what he was known for. Yeah. Um going against just an a a juggernaut of a USC team. Do you remember back when we were at ESPN this is right before this game happened right before I actually Started working at ESPN. You were you at ESPN yet at this point? I was. Yeah. Okay. You had probably just started recently. So I remember when this was all going down. You know, there was there was a billboard at some point because that because I know ESPN and a bunch of other people were kind of positioned this as um, a chance for USC to really like this three peat type of thing that they were trying to put together, right? Like it was they had won in two thousand three, but they split it with LSU that year but they claimed it in 2004 they won 2005 was the chance for a three-peat so I just specifically remember leading up to this like that that debate of is this a chance for a three-peat or is this just a chance to go back to back do you remember that yeah you know it, it's it's one of those things where I, the, the the Carson Palmer team there that 2000 the team that shared the national championship that you talked about they kind of get forgotten about mm -hmm. I that mean was, that was Saban's know, they, first championship yeah, they get they get forgotten about, and you know once this this USC team sort of you know burst onto the scene, I think that was a case of trying to have something exciting to talk about about this team because if you just focused on their day to day games or week to week games, uh, there was nothing much to talk about because they were trouncing teams. Yeah, they were. So where were you when this game happened? Um, I was actually watching this game over a friend's house. Again, this was a you know this was one of those. Monday night national championship games. Yep. I was just out of college. One of those things where I just started, you know, just started working at ESPN. Like you said, had the nine to five job. 
So I was uh, trying to be a good boy and watching it at my friend's house and not getting too crazy. <laughs> yeah, I was still in Alabama. I remember going over to a couple of friends' houses. We cooked out, grilled out, and like it was like you said, like you just want this game to live up to the hype. That's how I went into it, knowing this was you know top of my list. Um, got to be here. Got to sit through this with all the build up, all the hype, all the star power. I remember exactly like the living room I was sitting in when this thing happened. And that's, that's what happened a lot. But for this game, when it's not your team, you don't remember it quite as vividly, but for this game, I can't remember exactly where I was. So that's a little bit of setup. Anything else we need to set up before we get into this game? No, I mean, I, I think we're, I think we're ready to go here. I mean, it just, it, it was one of those games where the game did all the talking pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> the game surpassed the hype, which uh, is rare in these cases. So let's fire it up. Okay, we both went back. We watched the entire game, start to finish. Um, we will put a link, uh, the YouTube link that I watched. I don't know if we watched the same video, but my the one I watched was start to finish, cut out commercials. But let's go first impressions. Let's start off with the broadcast, okay? Because this, I think, is going to be one interesting part of it because technology's changed so much over the last 10, 15 years. You know, the way we watch sports is completely different. So ABC had this game, which no longer is the case anymore and your boy Keith Jackson was on the call absolutely and 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 you know in doing the research for this game you know I had forgotten this was Keith Jackson's last game so Keith Jackson last game in the Rose Bowl and I don't know why but there's something about that guy there's never been a guy on college football play-by-play on TV that has captured my interest like Keith Jackson maybe because he's a guy I grew up with but uh just an absolute legend and uh, your boy Dan Fouts also. Yeah, <laughs> Dan Fouts. You could have given me 30 guesses on who was the color analyst for this game, and I would not have guessed Dan Fouts. I do not remember Dan Fouts being a part of this game. Honestly, don't even remember him being a big part of college football back then. But I know he, had, you know, he has a lot of clout, and he's been around the sport, and I remember him more for NFL, but I never would have guessed he was on this call. But I, I laughed when I first saw him on there. You know, the biggest question is what happened to Dan Fouts? How did he fall so out of favor in college <laughs> football circles where he's going from doing the best game uh, possibly in college football history to now the second or third team on uh, NFL CBS with uh, Eye and Eagle? Great team, by the way, the bird <laughs> and the beard. But um, Dan Fouts right away. And he, he said some things uh, during the broadcast that I'm sure we'll get to here <laughs> that were a little problematic. At one point <laughs> – he called someone colorblind because he late hit someone out of bounds. <laughs> things things were different, and we're gonna we're, that that's one part of this game that I didn't really think I would pay attention to. But the sport and the just culture has changed so much since this game happened. But the other part of this was was this the first true HD game that we saw for a championship broadcast because I don't remember like this is that time Oh four Oh five Oh six where, you know, ESPN was transitioning and all the major networks were transitioning, but you still weren't, weren't having true HD for a lot of stuff. When you went back to this game, the quality was great. Yeah. It didn't feel like you were watching a game from 13 years ago. You know, it, it felt like you were watching a game that that could have been on this week. And I, I also think what adds to that is just the Rose bowl. I just even think in like 1985, somehow the Rose Bowl was in HD when everything else wasn't. Right. That place is just, it's just amazing. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it. The Rose Bowl is the best venue in, in, in football, and I wish every championship game was played there. There's just something different about that feel. The weather's always perfect. It was again on this night and uh, set the stage for a perfect championship game. So that's the broadcast. How about the coaches in this game? Because we all we automatically think of Pete Carroll and Mac Brown, okay? Obviously, two two great coaches during that period. Pete Carroll's gone on, gone on to some great things. Mac Brown, he had a great couple of years after this in Texas, and then it all came crashing down after the, the Rose Bowl, the next Rose Bowl appearance he had, and now he's at North Carolina. But it was the assistant coaches in this game that really captured our attention. Yeah, of course. I mean, Sarkeesian and Kiffin. I mean, have, can you think of two coaches – in the last, since this game happened, basically, that are known for more things other than actually coaching football than those two? <laughs> no, absolutely, actually not. It's been a crazy run for them. And and honestly, they've kind of spun their wheels since this time, right? I mean, Lane's obviously done a little bit more as a head coach, but do you feel like their credibility and their pedigree is much higher than it was in this game? I think all the jobs or most of the jobs that those guys have parlayed throughout their careers 
Okay. The one thing they can look back on as a serious success and that catapulted them, and maybe they're still living off to a certain point, is the fact that they got to be involved with this USC offense. Uh, I think that has a big thing to do with it. I think they've evolved over the years, coaches, especially Kiffin as an offensive coordinator. I don't know about as a head coach. Think about all the jobs that these two have had. Yeah. I mean, they've been head coaches for big programs. They've been coordinators uh, in the pros and in college for big organizations and big programs. It's really astounding. And it all started um, with them coaching this group at USC. The other side of this, too, those two guys were going against your boy Gene Chizik, the defensive coordinator for Texas at this time. I And look, I remember he was there, but I'd kind of forgotten the time frame. And when I heard his name mentioned across the field from these two guys, it really kind of piqued my interest. He was a great defensive coordinator at that time. Yeah, Gene. When I think of Gene Chizik, I, th- I I think of two things. <laughs> I think of that that video when he was coming off the plane when he got hired five and by 19, Auburn. Five and nineteen, yeah. And the guy yelling five and nineteen, Adam. Adam. And then after they won the national championship at Auburn, just thinking, I can't believe Gene Chizik is a national championship <laughs> college football coach. <laughs> It's amazing, but he was like he was the guy. I mean, he he led he led a he was a great defensive coordinator. Um, seems to be a great guy, and I it just caught my attention was here on there. But those were the big assistant coaches in this game. Underneath, obviously, the two headliners and Mac Brown and Pete Carroll. So the other big part of this, when you get into the game and watch it again, obviously, starting lineups come in right off the bat. It's going to catch your attention, and for me, yeah, there there were out of, out a few different takeaways because we knew the star power coming in. But the first thing I noticed in this game was Texas's front seven. Like there was, I don't know if there was anybody on that in that front seven that I could actually name or did I know anything about beyond this game. Now their secondary was awesome. They had a great secondary, a lot of talent. But that front seven on defense, there were n- really no big names or at least nobody that went on to have much of a career in the NFL. Yeah, and and you know surprising in the fact that if you look at their team defense the whole season leading up to this game it was great it's the total opposite of what we think of with those big 12 defenses and you hit it on the head that secondary was fierce with huff and griffin and you had aaron ross not even a starter yeah who became a pretty nfl player i mean he wasn't great but he was still a contributor uh for the giants and um some other teams throughout the course of his career and uh yeah it, it surprised me looking at the players that there was a lot of players I obviously knew on both sides of the ball for both teams, but the, the lack of really good NFL players that ended up, you know, coming out of this game, I guess we'll talk about that a little bit later, but there wasn't many great NFL players, but they were, but there was a ton of really good college players in this game. Yeah. The other guy that I wasn't, I'd forgot about at least being a part of this team. And one of these guys that you're talking about that actually wasn't an NFL player, Jamal Charles. I'd forgotten that he was in the backfield at the same time. He was a true freshman on this Texas team, but I'd forgotten that he was a part of that team because it was so focused on Vince Young. Yeah, and if you break it down, he's probably out of this game, out of the players who played significant roles, ended up being the best pro. And even during the broadcast, you had Fouts and Jackson both hinting at the fact that the only reason why he didn't start was maybe because Selvin Young. uh, I can't believe we're talking about Selvin Young, by the way. (laughs) What, What a, you know. This is crazy. But anyway, Selvin Young probably only starting because he had more experience. Why that matters for a running back, I have no idea. So any any other roster takeaways? Looking back on just the sheer firepower of USC. Yeah. I mean, it never gets old looking at that. It's like looking at one of those old Miami rosters. Yeah, for sure. It really was. It was an all-timer. So let's go into the game. Let's get into the game right now. And we can kind of go all over the place. So I'm just going to throw out my first thought. Let you play off of it, and then you got you you kind of just bounce back with what you were thinking. So let's just kind of start at the beginning of the game. USC comes out. USC gets off to a quick start. Uh, Texas gets a stop though, and then immediately fumbles the ball. Right, the first punt. So it was like you think back to this game. USC was the team to beat. Right, it was like if if Texas. They weren't really a David in this scenario because Vince Young was so good. But when you in that moment, USC was put on such a pedestal that they really were the Goliath in the situation. And and for Texas to come out and fumble that play early, I thought, you know, it back in retrospect, like, man, I can't believe USC just didn't jump on them early. The momentum was all in their favor. And I, I had forgotten overall. You brought up that you brought up that fumble. Then, then um, you uh, Texas went for it on a fourth and short a little bit later in the first quarter. Didn't get it. Mm-hmm. 
there was opportunities early in this game for USC to absolutely bury Texas. And, you know, they in the first quarter, or at least get out to a big lead, a bigger lead than they did. And they totally squandered it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, w- with all the theatrics that went on later in the game that we'll talk about, it's, it's a lot of times, I bet you if you talk to a USC fan, you know, they remember those squandered opportunities in that first quarter where they really could have built a lead. The other thing in this first quarter that I, I picked up on was, There was like three or four hits that would be targeting today and probably ejections for a couple of guys. And that punt, that that fumble punt was one. I think Michael Griffin had a a hit on a USC receiver uh, that he broke up the play, but it was straight helmet to helmet. I mean, it was like he just launched himself into the guy. But there was like three or four of these these plays where if it was today – would have been a completely different outcome. Yeah, you're talking about that play on the sideline with Griffin when he hit the fullback. Yep. That's the first thing I thought. I was like, whoa, this is <laughs> Al Riveron. Al Riveron would have a field day with that hit. Right, and I think Fouts probably made a comment like, this is football. Because I know he made one later in the game about Matt Leinart. When Matt Leinart got hit helmet to helmet, I think when he was sliding down, this is in the second half. But Fouts said, you know, we're going to timeout. He's got to shake the cobwebs off. That was like the whole way of thinking for – that old school college fo- uh, just football player in general, college or NFL, just shake off the cobwebs, you know, get back out there and just get after it. And as we've seen the last 10 years, that's been a detriment to the sport. Yeah, you miss you miss announcers being excited about big hits. These right. guys behind the mic today, they're so scared about their jobs, they have no reaction when someone's head almost gets taken off. Where, you know, 13 years ago, that got a serious reaction out of the announcers. Yeah, and you don't even see as many people get their heads taken off because of the rules now. So that's that was one thing that I, I uh, picked up on. But the other part, going to the second quarter, there was one key play that I always think back on. And I don't know if you're the same way, but it's the Reggie Bush lateral fumble. And I don't know about you, but if you would have asked me, I would have told you that play took place in the fourth quarter of this, of this game. I had no idea, thinking back, that this happened early second quarter. Yeah, and at the time, I I remember watching it, not thinking, wow, this could turn the momentum of the game. Because like we just talked about, to that point, USC had all the momentum. And that's kind of how Reggie Bush played. Maybe not with laterals, but he was always trying to hit the home run. And, you know, it was one of those things where, hey, Reggie Bush tried to hit a home run. It didn't work. It may not matter, though, because USC looks like they're going to be in control of this game. Uh, But then slowly um, the tide started to turn from there. And yeah, with how much that play is talked about. And I think part of that has to do with, for some reason, Reggie Bush is one of those guys where we point out everything bad he's done in his career on and off the field. Yeah. I I think that has a lot to do with it. I I felt like that play was bigger. And it probably was because, like you said, USC had a chance to bury Texas early on in that game. And I think that was part of it. They, you know, they had the lead. It wasn't a big lead at the time. But they were going right back down the field again. And, you know, had he held on to that ball and not try to make the, the home run play, they had the ball at the 35-yard line or so, and it doesn't look like they're going to get slowed down. They're probably going to score again and go up two scores early on, and who knows how Texas bounces back from that point. But, you know, ABC, and shout out to the graphic producer in this game, They I don't know if you noticed this, but about probably like two minutes, well, probably five minutes of game time before this fumble, ABC threw up the graphic that said, Bush and White, 452 touches, only one fumble during the last 452 touches. And it wasn't, but like three touches later that Bush had this fumble. The old graphic producer jinx. <laughs> it happens, doesn't it? There's not yeah, a announcer not. jinx. It's a graphics producer jinx. Shout out Mitch yeah, Hummer, sure who's is. a graphics producer now. <laughs> uh, so that was, I thought, was was one of the big plays. Anything else first half that you had a, that you that caught your attention? No, the first half, I, I kind of likened, you know, Texas is sort of pushed towards the end of the first half. Um, I just thought this was sort of like a, you know, a boxing match, the early rounds of a championship boxing match, you know, the one that goes the distance. They're just sort of feeling each other out and Texas going on that little spurt at the end um, to take the lead at halftime. I think when that happened, I sort of sat up and said, OK, we're going to have a game here in the second half. This is going to be awesome. You know, that was the first uh, that that was the first at halftime. You sort of reset and you're like, man, can't wait for the second half. Yeah, because USC got off to a good start, it was up seven, nothing. And then Texas. um Scored 16 second quarter points. Now, almost forgot about this, by the way. Almost moved on to the second half. But how about the 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 Vince Young touchdown, his lateral that came shortly after Reggie Bush's lateral, where his knee was clearly down. 
no review, touchdown, and they they might have scored, sure, but when you look back, that his knee was down to like the 11-yard line, so you're looking at first and goal, essentially, from the 10.5-yard line. They wouldn't have got a first down. You're, so you're talking about a tough spot to try to score a touchdown, and I don't feel like enough was made out of that, and, and maybe it's just because we live in this world of replay now where everything gets reviewed and overturned, but at that time, I thought that was such a huge play. And what I liked about that play also, first of all, you're, you're obviously right. His knee was down. Was the confusion on Fouts and, and <laughs> Keith Jackson's part. Keith Jackson thought he fumbled. And Dan Fouts just, even for like two or three plays after that, just couldn't get over the fact that his knee was down. And and again, <laughs> you know, it, it, I like the fact that he, he shows so much emotion because you don't see that these days. But Keith Jackson, again, great announcer. You know, uh, you know the the fumble part of that was was, was pretty funny. It was just confusion, you know, because it was such an odd play. Um, but like you said, you know, that definitely uh, turned the tides. Yeah, it did. So it was sixteen to ten going into the second half, and this is when everything really picked up. Like you said, I think your analogy uh, with the heavyweight boxing match is spot on. It was kind of filling each other out, going back and forth, some big plays, you know, some mistakes, but. They were toe-to-toe going into halftime. Coming back out, again, USC, much like the way they started, really enforced their will early on and seemed to be getting that momentum back. And a lot of it was because of your boy Lindell White, who was a really a man possessed in this game and really overshadowed Reggie Bush. Yeah, and, and you know some of the career stats that they were posting during this game for Lendale White. I mean the the twenty four twenty five touchdowns in this season, the the fifty five touchdowns overall for his career. Um, and and, and th- when this game was played, he was only a junior, by the way. And Lendale White, I, I think we it's pretty easy because he, you know he maybe he didn't have the pro career people thought he was going to have, or maybe he had the pro career people thought he was going to have. I'm not really sure which way I lean on that. <laughs> um, but he, there's no doubt, he was a great college running back and overshadowed by Bush and Liner and Jarrett, but he meant a lot to that team. Yeah, he was really good in this game. And and I think a lot of it was Reggie Bush lost confidence after that fumble. It didn't seem – he had – the second half, he kind of turned the corner again, but it looked like he was a little timid, maybe not as confident. He, he didn't play as much in some of those possessions. Lindell White got a lot of the carries, and uh, but, but Reggie did kind of come, come to at the end of this game and made some big plays. So I got some thoughts late fourth quarter. What, what third quarter, early fourth quarter, anything that you want to talk about before we move to like how this game ended? You know, the one thing I, I, I sensed that maybe starting to happen was USC and just them coming at you in waves sort of wearing Texas down. And I think to a certain degree, it did wear most of the team down for Texas. But as we'll get to here now, I'm sure the one person that didn't wear down was Vince Young. Uh, I thought the, the rest of the team looked uh, – I thought USC's offense started to gain momentum. What's lost in this is the third quarter and fourth quarter that Matt Leinart had. Uh, he had a great yeah. third and fourth quarter in this game. And um, though that was my sort of takeaway from the third, early fourth quarter was, uh, you know, Texas played well, but this might be it. Yeah, even watching it again, it, it felt that way. Like, I know what's going to happen here, but, man, USC's in control of this game. And you're right, they outscored them 28-10, to 10, scored that last touchdown with six minutes and 42 seconds left. Texas was down 38-26. At this point, to me – I mean, even watching again, how do they come back from this? Because it wasn't like Texas was just taking deep shots. I mean, it was, you know, methodical drives for the most part. I mean, they were getting big chunks of yardage, 10, 15, 20 yards uh, at a time on some plays. But it wasn't like they were scoring in a minute and a half. For 642 in this game, felt like that's going to be two possessions at best. And that's if they stop uh, USC pretty quickly. That was the bigger factor for me. Could they stop USC? And like you hit on, Vince Young was not known for someone who's going to bomb the ball down the field against a good defense and, you know, beat you sort of a uh, Drew Brees style. He was, he was no, you know, the, the drives that he led tend to be longer in nature. Like you said, they tend to involve a lot of him running and, or short to interim passes. And it was one of those things where a, do they have enough time and B, even if they do, can they even stop USC once um, to make this happen? Well, that takes us to probably the biggest play of the game. That was USC. So USC gave up a touchdown, had the ball back. We're moving down the field again, right, with like like under two minutes. They get across midfield, fourth and two at the Texas 44-yard line, and this was the game. I mean, I, I credit Pete Carroll. I don't think it was a bad call. Pete Carroll goes, goes for it there, going for the win, and 
hands the ball to the guy that's had a great game, Lindell White. So I thought it was a great call, but I was shocked now thinking back on it. Why wasn't Reggie Bush in that game? You're talking about the Heisman Trophy winner. I don't care how he's played this game, which it wasn't actually that bad, minus that one boneheaded play. But how was he not in this game in some aspect where you're forcing Texas to have to pay attention to both running backs? Even just to exactly have him out there as a decoy. I mean, Pete Carroll in these fourth and short situations oh boy. with the season on the line in championship games. I mean, you know, give me a break here. You know what I mean? I mean, how, how, this is the this is the first time we would see it later in the Super Bowl. But I just think that you know th- they overthought it a little bit. They did. Um, yeah, I think I, I just I just think it's that simple. They did, and and credit Texas because they stood up when they had to. They had not stopped Lindell White. They had not really even slowed him down for the most part. He was he was running pretty wild in this game, and they stopped him a foot short. And that's what gave them the ball back and set up the drive that Vince Young put together to win this game, to win the championship. And really, I mean, there's not a whole lot to say about that final drive. Obviously, it's still, even all to the very end, didn't feel like it was a guarantee that Texas was going to score because even with Vince Young, threw the ball in the end zone. He had There was one big play where he threw across the field, an awful throw from, going, I think he was falling backwards on the left side of the field, threw all the way to the right, and Texas defensive back, or sorry, USC's defensive back, decided just to knock the ball down, swatted it, instead of trying to pick it off. And that was really the break that Texas needed. Yeah, I've heard Vince Young actually, they did uh, one of those um, a football life shows on this game in particular. And a big focus of it was Liner and, and Young. And Young made a special point to say that that was one play where, thankfully, the, like you said, the, 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 the uh, defensive back didn't try to intercept it, tried to knock it down. And then now we get a situation where Vince Young in this drive, not that he didn't do anything special, but it was just Vince Young being Vince Young. And, and it was a, it was a sight to see for sure. And he, uh, he he scrambled for that that play. You heard the clip at the beginning of the show, the fourth and what was it fourth and two, and then uh, or whatever it was fourth and short, scrambled, got away. Vince Young, as you mentioned, being Vince Young, got to the corner of the end zone. But the other part of this that I I forgot about was USC came back, and there was only what sixteen or eighteen seconds left on the clock or whatever it was. USC got a huge chunk of yardage on first down. First, it was that pooch kick. So they got the ball like the 30. They get the ball across midfield in one play. And they're still like, what was there, like eight seconds, 10 seconds left? And they had an opportunity there to take one more shot, get 10 or 15 yards, only down three points. But Liner at the very end of that game, that last play, he ran off eight seconds rolling out and scrambling, rolling all over the field, trying to find a receiver before throwing it away and blew the entire eight seconds on that last play. Yeah, and and a, an uncharacteristic play by Leonard, who, you know, again, for this era of college football, um, the consistency he had was very rare for a college quarterback. And for him to make a mistake like that made it all the more glaring. And you're absolutely correct, though. That is something that I didn't even have any recollection of. I don't remember anyone talking about it after the game. I don't remember anybody talking about it since. But it definitely, you know, in this in this day and age when we live in the, uh, hey, Tom Brady has the ball with 30 seconds left and, oh, did we leave him too much time? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you realize how much that eight seconds, eight seconds matters. Yeah. And they were like at the 40 yard line, the 45. I mean, it was literally like one 15 yard completion with that, that all those receivers, Dwayne Jarrett, we hadn't even mentioned his name in the show, but Dwayne Jarrett, I mean, you know, you can't get 15 yards and just get, get down and, and stop the clock and, and take a, at least take a shot at a field goal. But that was it, and and Vince closed it out. Texas won one of the best games uh, of all time, one of the classic championship games. And I want to give a couple – let's go a quick, quick observations, takeaways from this game before we get into, like, postgame and the aftermath and kind of what's happened since. And to me, the biggest thing I thought in this game was, like, this was 13 years ago, but, dude, it seemed like we were watching a completely different sport. I mean, the formations, you know, one, one receiver wide, eye formations – Run, run, run. I mean, play action. Like, play calling we do not see anymore with the way this this sport is set up where it's protect the quarterback and let's air it out. Yeah, I, and w- another thing, I, the play calling, getting getting to that also, you know, just to chime in there, there's the absence of the bubble screens. There wasn't a ton of bubble screens in <laughs> yeah, this game. Yeah, and, and that's crazy right? for Elaine Kiffin offense too, by the way. Yeah, I mean, Mr. Mr. Bubble Screen, right? So – I noticed that and other other observations in this game, but hey, how about this observation? Did you notice who two of the three big Texas fans were on the sidelines? Who? So you had McConaughey, right. who's Mr. Texas football. You had Roger Clemens, 
and you had Lance Armstrong. Yeah, some firepower, especially this time in 2005, 2006. Yeah. How <laughs> problematic is that in 2019, though? I'm guessing, <laughs> I'm guessing Mac wouldn't want Roger Clemens or Lance Armstrong around his team uh, if if the game was happening today. McConaughey is still clean, right? Yeah, he's good. Oh yeah, he, he's he's Mr. Texas man. Yeah, I, I think uh, everyone's okay. Everyone's okay with Matt. The only other thing I had to take away from this, looking back, I mean, it was the greatest when Vince Young scored, and that, and, and immediately after that game ended, the, the confetti was out. It was the greatest confetti shot of all time, and it happened so quick. And he was, and he, he you know, ended up being a Sports Illustrated cover. But I still think that was the greatest confetti shot of all time. It was. It, it was perfect. I mean, nothing more to say. All right, let's go into post game now. Aftermath. What's on your mind after this game? So let's just start off with these two programs. Was it four years later? Pete Carroll left, was gone to Seattle. At the same time, Mac Brown was finishing up his career in Texas. I think it was like five or six years, and he retires. But these two teams, I mean, this game was the pinnacle. And they had some pretty good years in the following you know, couple of years after this. But, man, had these two programs fallen off since. Absolutely. I mean, and I was, I'll admit, I was actually surprised, even though these two teams didn't win a national championship after this, and Texas was the only, Texas appeared in one versus your uh, Crimson Tide. But I was actually surprised in 06, 07, 08, USC didn't finish lower than fourth in the final poll. Obviously, in 09, Carroll leaves after they go nine and four when the, you know, Reggie Bush sanctions are about to come down. He bolts for Seattle. And then Texas has a couple average seasons right after this, but then during the Colt McCoy years, they go 12 and one back to back years. Mm -hmm. And then sort of Mac Brown's career. um, He has average seasons from there on out. He sort of just fades in the distance and Pete Carroll. I know he's known for winning at USC um, I don't want to say he's just as known for the trouble that followed after he left, but that's definitely a part of his legacy you can't ignore. Yeah, and looking back on this too, I, I always think it's interesting to to kind of consider what a playoff would have looked like at that time. But to show you how far the sport's come and how much things have changed the landscape of the sport since this game, do you know that final BCS standings, USC and Texas, then you had Penn State, Ohio State, and Oregon. So there was a really good chance that a playoff existed at this time. You would have either had two Big Ten teams or two Pac-12 teams, which seems absurd now because the, the Pac-12 can't even sniff the playoff at this point. Yes, yeah, so you had Penn State, Oregon, right? Yeah, Penn State, Ohio State, and Oregon, followed by Notre Dame. And then the first SEC team is Georgia at seven. I'm trying. I'm trying now. I'm trying to think of the big players on those teams that you just mentioned. I'm trying to think who was good on on Penn State that year. That that they would have been that highly ranked. Yeah, that was uh, that was Joe Paw back in his his prime too, and that I think they had a really good defense at that time. I don't remember exactly who was on that, but I'm pretty sure they had a pretty good linebacker, defensive lineman in that period that was uh, a standout. But you know, Robbie Gold was their kicker. I pulled it up real quick. You remember him? But yeah, I mean, you look at their quarterbacks. Is Michael? Is that is that the Michael Robinson? Is, yeah. Is that the Michael Robinson yep. team? Yep. Yeah, he became he became he later became the fullback. Yep. Right. Michael Robinson. The Seahawks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. And was that Joey Harrington or is that, or is that after Joey Harrington? I think that was Joey Harrington probably. Yeah. I think it probably okay. was. I don't have a problem. So yeah, that's how different the landscape looked at that time though. And it's completely shifted in the sec really, honestly, after this and with the coming of Nick Saban into Alabama, that's kind of with, you know, and he had done this at LSU at the time during this period, but that's kind of where the shift began where the, where sec kind of started taking over a little bit and pushing the pac 12 out the big 10 and big 12 still kind of been there, but uh, the Pac-12 has definitely not been the same since Pete Carroll left uh, that conference. Yeah, because when Pete Carroll came to star power at USC, and and it and it and I think it elevated all those other programs, sort of like you see with with Alabama, quite frankly, yeah. right? You had these other teams, even besides LSU in that SEC West, sort of elevating their level of play to to sort of try to match Alabama, right? Hey, come to Ole Miss. Uh, will not only pay you a lot of money, but you, know, you can play against you know you can play against <laughs> Alabama every year, right? You know? Right. All right. So this is a part I, I'm curious on your your opinion on because you are you are an NFL guy, I follow it much closer than I do. But so every every show we're going to look at kind of how these star players and some of the players in this game what happened to them after this game. That's going to be a big part of how this show develops and what we talk about. So this one was full of star power: Vince Young, Matt Liner, Reggie Bush, Lindell White. A lot of other pros, at least guys that got a chance. So the first question I got for you is, 
when you watch this game again and watch the way Vince Young played, but it's particularly the way he threw the ball and his release and, and the short passes. It he, he was look, he was pretty accurate. But were you surprised at all the way his career played out after watching him again in this game? No, I, th- I think you forget. Like I mentioned before, I mean, I think I think when you're when you're in college and you you're only really proficient throwing those short to medium passes like we talked about but you're more athletic than 90 percent of the people on the field i think your ability to run and and make plays and scramble can allow you to be how as good as vince young was um but then once you get in the nfl you you have to operate in the pocket i hate to sound like a uh you know an old school football guy but there hasn't been many quarterbacks yet that have stood the test of time in the nfl that weren't a primary you know pocket passer and i think that's i think between that and him admittedly not taking the time to prepare, even Jeff Fisher, which surprisingly <laughs> he's been very outspoken about the fact that Vince yeah. Young maybe didn't really care about football that much. When you combine those two things, I think that's what led to his uh, demise as a quarterback in the NFL. So you look at this, who had, who had the best NFL career out of this out of this game? I mean, Reggie Bush had a pretty good career. I mean, not spectacular, but he had some high, high moments. He only, he only rushed for 1,000 yards twice in his NFL career. Lindell White, I think – you know, got got out of shape a little bit, and Matt Liner now a TV guy. Player wise, what did you what did you make out of this this game? Look, I looked at the starting lineups and all the guys who played. Obviously, I think for Liner, Bush, and Young in particular, just to, to talk about those guys for a second, as far as the NFL goes, this was the last time where they were probably predominantly known and remembered for their football play on the field. Um, Liner got into some trouble off the field, not trouble, but just, you know, sort of a controversial guy off the field. Bush, obviously for the stuff that came out later for the stuff he was doing at USC, um, with the, with the benefits, uh, legal benefits and whatnot. And then we already discussed young, but if you look at the best players from this game, professionals, I think you have to go Jamal Charles. I'm talking guys who had a significant role. Ryan Khalil was actually the center for USC in this game. Yeah. The two safeties, uh, from Texas, Griffin and Huff ended up being good pros. Again, I'm surprised there's not there wasn't better pros in this game when you look back on it. I expected there to be great pros sprinkled across the field, and there just wasn't. Yeah, you had Frosty Rucker. Then you had Brian Cushing as a freshman in this game. Ray Maluga was a freshman, I think, in this game too. I think he, he he did a little bit in the NFL. But, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, there's a lot of good college star power, but where their career went after this was a bit of a surprise. And it honestly kind of speaks to what, Vince Young was able to do with this team because they had some good defensive players in the secondary, but otherwise it wasn't, it wasn't an all time great roster from top to bottom. I wouldn't say so. All right. So let's do a couple of things here that we'll do every game. Let's start with what if play the what if game. And, and with this, you know, basically how does history change if this game if a play in this game goes one way or the other in this one in retrospect, there's not a lot of, there weren't, weren't a lot of mistakes necessarily made I think to me it was probably still the Reggie Bush fumble. Even though it happened in the second quarter, it did kill the momentum, I think, both for Reggie personally as a player in this game, but also USC, and they really had a chance to bury him. Is there anything else, kind of a what-if scenario from this game that you had? You know, I, I go back – I, I mean, I just go back to, to the what-if on that fourth and two. If if if, if Lendale White, right, gets that yeah. – get, converts that first down, you know, w- what happens then? I mean, there's no – No, it's over no, at that point. I mean, I think that has a long range. I think that has ramifications to the NFL draft when these guys went, to be completely honest with you. Okay. Um, because I think I think it's pretty well known that once the NFL draft came along, the Titans had the, I believe it was the third pick, right? So it went Mario Williams, Reggie Bush, and then with the third pick, you had Jeff Fisher, USC guy, Norm Chow, USC guy who worked with Matt Leiner. They both wanted Matt Leiner. The tight how the story goes is the late owner of the Titans, Bud Adams, intervenes and says, No. Uh, the Texans passed on a hometown guy, Vince Young. I still have some animosity towards Houston as the former owner of the football team there. And I want Vince Young because of how great he played in that Rose Bowl game. So if Lendale White converts that fourth and two, is there ever even the legend of Vince Young? Does Matt Leinart you know, go to the Titans and his history written differently in both their careers. That's a great point. I hadn't thought about it to that level, but yeah, I mean, what, what is Vince Young's legacy at that point? That's a, I like that. That's pretty deep going social, social media. How does this, how would this have changed things? Cause a lot of the games we're going to be talking about didn't have social media around, right? We're going to go back beyond that. So a couple of things in this game, this might've been the last, this 
In fact, this probably was the last big major sporting event without the advent of the cell phone, camera. I mean, I saw dudes on the sideline with those little handheld digital cameras. You had one. I had one. We were in that day and age where you carry that that damn digital camera around when you went out with friends or if you went on vacation, you had to take a separate camera with your with your phone because your phone didn't have the capabilities of taking a, a clear picture. This was the last game, I think, that did not have, A, everybody holding up cell phones in the stands, and B, like th- it, it was just all purely about what's happening on the field. That, that's actually a really good point. Everyone was paying attention to the game. To load your SD card in and out of your uh, <laughs> digital camera was a little bit cumbersome. So yes. people uh, people chose to pay attention to the great game going on in front of them instead of worrying about that stuff. <laughs> and social media, I mean, it's just changed so much. I mean, how much is 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 Pete Carroll getting crushed for, yeah. for, for that fourth down call? How much is just these players in general, when you have Bush, Leinert, and Young – these are these are guys, three guys who probably didn't handle fame as good as they probably you know would have hoped they w- would have hoped they would when they look back on it. What would have been like if these guys were even ten times more rock stars than they already were? H- how how does that impact them as a whole as far as their college careers go? Yeah, and we, we think back at this game too. You know, we talked about where we watched this game. We experienced this game the first time with just our close friends we were watching it with. There was no, like, let's see the reaction going on, on online. There was none of this, like, let's join the conversation, look for jokes, share gifs. Like, none of that stuff was happening. I mean, you lived in the moment with your friends, and then, like, you left the next day or you called somebody and, and said, did you just see what I just saw in this game? Like, it was a completely different experience, and I think that's what makes this game special, too, is that it was the last kind of pure sporting event that lived inside a capsule that you experienced with whoever was with you, and that was it, right? You didn't share it. It wasn't just, it didn't become a meme. All that stuff didn't happen. It was just about the game and your experience with it. And it was kind of that last kind of pure event that we got to kind of be a part of. Yeah, and the storylines, you know, the the storylines that we have a lot of times these days come from what's being talked on social media. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I didn't have anywhere, we didn't have anywhere to go reference and say, man, that Reggie Bush lateral. What an important part of the game. What an important play in the game that was. We thought for ourselves. You're sitting there watching it, and at the end of the game, I don't know about you, but I wasn't thinking about that lateral. I was thinking about how awesome Vince Young was. Right. Uh, Last thing I want to do, and we'll do this some too, I want to do like a what if I told you kind of segment to close things out. I want to Let's just throw out some scenarios. And this is a really like looking back on this game, if you could kind of change the course of history or you know what's happened since. If I would have told you back then what we know now, So I'm going to throw out one to you, and if you want to throw one back, you can. What if I told you, Mike, that Mac Brown, the head coach of the national championship Texas Longhorns, would be back coaching at North Carolina in less than 15 years? Mac Brown, although he's probably putting on a nice face about being back at North Carolina, he probably wishes he was awesome at Texas and still there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that, that's, that, that's, that's what I would say. And, and Mac Brown's one of those guys, seems like everyone loves him. You never hear anyone say a bad word about Mac Brown. And I think in the end with Mac Brown, he's just one of those guys where when he has the horses, he wins. And when he doesn't, he doesn't. Right. Um, and that's to be said for a lot of coaches. But, um, yeah, I'm sure you're going to be uh, enjoying some of the uh, Mac Brown era down there. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> what if I told you Alabama would be in this game the next time it returned to the Rose Bowl? When you think back about where Alabama was when this game happened. Exactly. Where you wouldn't was, have said anything. Alabama was where, garbage. I'm trying to think. Was point. it Andrew Zhao? Was it the Andrew Zhao era? This, or not? Honestly, though, this was the one good year. Alabama got off to, I think, an 8 or 9 0 start. That was when they beat Tennessee. Remember that game? The, the fumble through the end zone. It was a team with D'Amico Ryan's really good defense, but the offense was garbage. And uh, they just won enough games. I think they ended up with two losses. You know, post DuBose, Franchoni, Mike Price, Mike Shula. Uh, this was Mike Shula, but this is all this kind of like everything was bad forever, and they finally kind of turned the corner. But with the way the program was, never would have guessed in a million years when this BCS championship game cycled back through that Alabama would be there playing Texas again. Shocked that you weaved Alabama into this podcast. I mean, that's hey, that's my perspective on it. Uh, the only other thing I would say is what if I told you, and I think I already asked you this, these programs would essentially be non-factors from this game and about five years after this game. They were just – Basically non-factors. They got a lot of media hype, but otherwise they were not really relevant to the national championship discussion. 
You know, you never would have believed it, especially especially USC. And you know, they both would get they both would get close. They they both had good seasons, but but nothing compared to to this season. How does this game hold up to you? Honestly, the game itself is we now we've had a lot of good college football playoff games, national championship games, what have you. Okay. I know your team's been featured in a lot of those. We've Couple had a good games since. All right. But this game, as far as the back and forth and as far as the subplots go, as far as college football games go. Now, again, I probably go back watching college football pretty regularly since the mid nineties. This is the best game with the highest stakes that I've ever seen. Yeah, I think it holds up too. I think it, you know it was slow early on, but when this game really kind of got rolling and and the star power showed up and the the big players made the big plays, you remember why this is still talked about years later, and it it definitely holds up in my mind. So all around, man, an awesome game, still one of the best of my lifetime, like you said, and uh, good to go back and relive this. Is there anything else you want to end on from this game, or anything that we missed before we wrap it up for this show? I, I think we I think we we covered it all angles. I'm 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 good. Cool. All right. So remember, this is the Distant Replay Podcast. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcasting app you choose to use. But subscribe for us so you can get the next episode delivered to your inbox. We're gonna try to have one episode a week. We're gonna go back and look at old games. We got a list of games that we have in mind that we're gonna move forward with. But if you have a game that you think we should go back and watch your game that you remember that you'd like to relive, hit us up on Twitter at distant podcast. You can email us at distant at gmail.com and make sure you check out the show notes for this episode on our website, distant replay podcast. I really look forward to what we can do with the website in terms of showing, sharing some stuff from these games that we talk about. And in this game, I'll put a link to the game itself. So you can go back to YouTube and watch it, throw it up on your Google Chromecast. It's like watching a game again with the technology we have, but also I'm going to throw a couple of screenshots of uh, Lane Kiffin and his goatee when they showed him up in the press box. I thought that was amazing. The kid looks young. You said Sark looks pretty young in this game too, but I'm going to throw those screenshots up there. So you can go back and see him if you don't have time to watch this game again subscribe on apple podcasts make sure you follow us thank you for listening to the first episode of distant replay mike i've enjoyed this i'm looking forward to what this becomes same here ben on to episode two that's going to do it for us again subscribe follow talk to us we want to hear your thoughts on this game as well as everything we talk about that's it for us on distant replay we'll talk to you next time